in different nerd circles, there is a lot of hurt. A lot of us grew up feeling isolated, feeling ostracized, feeling like people didn't really get us. Just this search for belonging and acceptance that comes with it. This is the Humans of Gaming podcast, an open and honest conversation about games, life, and belief. Welcome to Humans of Gaming, I'm Drew Dixon, I'm the Chief Content Nerd at Love Thy Nerd, and I'm joined, as always, with Chris Gwaltney, by Chris Gwaltney, joined by Chris Gwaltney. Joined by hey, Chris. <laughs> joined and Chris Gwaltney. Hey, I'm Chris, <laughs> I'm the Chief Executive Nerd with Love Thy Nerd, and this is Humans of Gaming, um, where we have people that are in the games industry, either video games or board games or otherwise, and just talk to them about their life and who they are as people and get to know them a little bit so that you can get to know them a little bit. And hopefully that creates some empathy and compassion and honestly just genuine love for this culture and the people that are in it. So today's pretty cool because I mean, maybe it seems a little self-serving, but <laughs> we have April Lynn, who is one of our founders with Love Thy Nerd and is on staff with us doing tons of different stuff and mm -hmm. we got to chat with her and get to know her a little bit more today it's also cool because like i think sometimes we the people we know the best sometimes we just assume we know things about them that we don't actually know because we haven't dug deep enough so it was cool for me to just learn even more about her story and where she comes from and how how she thinks because april is like a really close friend of, of mm -hmm. mine and yours both of us mm -hmm. um and so yeah, I think there's like a lesson there for us all, I think probably about just don't assume you know things yeah. about the people even like super close to you. So. Ask more questions. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I've I've known April Lynn for, what is it, like seven years now? You know, like I, I the things she said today, like I've heard a lot of it, but there were still new things yep. that she shared today that I had no idea. And I've yep. known her for seven years and worked in close proximity with her and like been really mm -hmm. good friends with her. But you just ask different questions, you'd learn different stuff. Yeah, and some of the people that listen to the podcast will already know April Lynn, but I think the, this will be a you'll learn a lot that you didn't know. And mm -hmm. um, also, I think it's just important. We think it's important that you know if you're going to participate with what we're trying to do at Love Liner, that you that we make ourselves available to you, and that we you know get, give an opportunity for you to get to know the people who make Love Liner move and operate. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of one of our efforts to do that. Well, it's a good conversation and we'll get to it in a little bit, but we wanted to hit a couple things for you guys as we always do. Hopefully you don't just skip over this part, but we, uh, <laughs> one of the things that we always want to give the opportunity and we'll talk about all the time and you'll get annoyed about it because it's about money, but it's just the reality of who we are and what we do is we're a nonprofit and we only live and thrive off the generosity of others. And so if you like what we do, if you're into what we do, if it if it benefits you in any way or, or the people you know are close to, like, please consider jumping into this thing with us. Um, what's actually maybe a lot of people don't know is that all of us, the staff, the founders of Love Thy Nerd actually also give to Love Thy Nerd. Mm -hmm. uh, it may seem kind of weird and like circular or something, um, but it's just a value for us and we don't want to ask other people to do something that we ourselves aren't doing. And so if this is something that you're interested in, you can go to lovethynerd.com slash partner um, and you can give a recurring monthly amount. It can literally be a dollar. Uh, if everybody that listened to this podcast, everybody that was a part of our, our online communities and stuff gave a dollar, like we would be set. Um, and we know people can give more than that. So yeah, just think about it, pray about it, um, talk to us about it, ask questions. We'd love to to chat about any of that stuff, but you can go to lovethynerd.com slash partner and um, hook it up. But yeah, we also want to tell you about some of the things that, um, you know, your your money would go to help us do. Like this podcast is one of those things, of course, in our website and our, our podcast network. Um, but uh, also like we started a new project or I kind of started a new project along with Bubba. Bubba's helping me produce some videos where we're just trying to encourage people in the midst of quarantine. So mm -hmm. um 
for me, like here in Tennessee, like there's some restrictions there for parts of our state that are starting to ease up a little bit, but we're still a long way away from like life as normal. And I think that's the case for most people. In fact, I think most people will probably aren't even taking the steps that Tennessee is yet. So it's just, it's just a weird, um, depressing, (laughs) difficult time. Like, in fact, this week, like I found out that my primary employer, um, you know, had to let some people go, um, like quite a few because of how deeply this, uh, this pandemic has affected, Mm -hmm. um, our company, the company I work for. So, um, yeah, it's just, it sucks. And so we want to help you keep some perspective during that. And so it's just me like opening up the Bible basically and trying to give people some hope and uh, see how hopeful the story of the Bible is and Mm -hmm. how it can give us some perspective in the midst of really, really difficult times. doesn't always give us the answers, but it does give us perspective and um, points us to a future hope and even a present hope that can um, sustain us. And so, um, yeah, if you think that would at all be encouraging, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, We're just putting out a ton of stuff on YouTube right now. So Um, much stuff. Yeah, Matt Warnbeer is streaming a lot. Um, we've got Beard Bros episodes. There's just there's a lot going on, a lot of co-optional. Um, if you don't know what those things are, go to our YouTube channel and watch them. That's the best way to learn what those things are that I just mm-hmm. said. So, um, yeah, subscribe to us on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, I think that's basically it. So without further ado, I hope you really enjoy this conversation with one of our dear, dear friends, April and Coet. Hey, how's it going? What's up? I'm Drew. Although we already introduced ourselves. (laughs) Should I start over? (laughs) Yes. I think you should just start with, hey, April Lynn. That's right. We should. Okay. Hey, April Lynn, how are you? Hi, I'm I'm good. So uh, tell us who you are. I know you pretty well, and Chris knows you pretty well. Barely. I think maybe even, I think it's like higher than pretty well, but I just don't know how to like... Yeah, and probably like 90% of the people that listen to this know me pretty quite, well. But for quite. the other 10%, uh, I'm April Lynn. I'm the chief resource nerd at Love Thy Nerd, which means that I do resources. <laughs> um, I help to coordinate, write, and pitch like articles that are resource material education uh helpful resource information for our website, some other stuff too. I wrote um, some curriculum last year for Grow Curriculum that Mm -hmm. someday will get published, maybe. (laughs) I think it is published now. Is it? I think so. They didn't tell us anything. Anyways. Yeah, where's our check? No, they did. They emailed us about it. (laughs) Well, then I just ignored their email. So sorry, guys. (laughs) I'll go back and read that now. We'll have to go look and see. I think it's available now, but we should go. We go. We should go check that out. But yeah, it was killer stuff. The stuff that uh, you and I worked on. Uh, Mostly you. Yeah. Drew wrote the uh, kind of message, like study portion of it. But I wrote a lot of like event curriculum basically a mini convention for churches to run with their youth group that was like all nerd related like a mini comic con or 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 video game show type deal yeah exactly so there was like a sherlock holmes themed uh scavenger hunt type thing like mystery uh which was really cool and i want to play myself (laughs) and i don't even remember what it what it was but it was a whole bunch of different like nerdy themed activity areas where you could do different things like make a pod racer and build a card tower competition, uh, play some board games. Hey, so I want to set the record straight for all (laughs) of our thousands, tens of thousands of listeners. And this is, I'm doing this, I'm doing this for you, April in. Okay. Oh no. Okay. So this, I want all everyone to know this woman's name is April Lynn. (laughs) It is not April. That is not her name. And she's too nice and polite to correct you unless she really knows you. And then she will not be nice or polite when she corrects you. <laughs> but her name I, is April Lynn. There you go. I at least set, I don't know, a hundred people straight. However many people okay. listen to this. I appreciate it. Yep. So how did you get into like, uh, have you, have you always, would you always have called yourself like a nerd, a geek? How'd you get into that kind of work? Oh man. Uh, well, in terms of, 
work. I mean, if we want to go further back than when I was working. Yeah, sure. (laughs) I, yeah, I don't know if I would have always used the word nerd, but uh, I was playing video games as early as I have memories. When I was a kid, we had a Tandy Color Computer, which is like a Radio Shack brand computer. Back in the day. I have never heard of that. Well, you can look it up. I've heard of it. (laughs) <laughs> you guys yeah, are older you are older than me it was before my time yeah it, it kind of was actually do you remember the first game you played on it uh the very first game not sure about the very first game but some of the first games i played so there was a game called rocky's boots which was a game it basically taught you how to program in a very very basic way like taught you about um logic gates And Mm. so you'd be going through this little, like walking through this little maze kind of thing. Not really a maze because there was usually only one way to go, but it was like a series of rooms and each one taught you about a different kind of logic gate. And in the end, you would put them together and make a little program. And there were boots and it was all run by this raccoon named Rocky. I thought it had something to do with like Rocky the movie and like his boots. No, no, it was a (laughs) raccoon. Uh, And so I played a lot of that. I really liked that. Uh, I played this Winnie the Pooh uh, text adventure game. It had pictures, but it was basically a text adventure. And so you'd go north or set, like go north or go south, and you were traveling around the Hundred Acre Wood trying to figure out what happened to all your friends, uh, where they all went. Did you find out where they all went? I'm sure that I did. I don't really remember. I think they were throwing a surprise birthday party for you or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, And there was another one that was Mickey's space adventure or something. And that one was actually kind of scary because you could go onto a planet and run out of oxygen. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Uh, (laughs) Which, yeah, for like a three-year-old, that's kind of traumatic. Yeah. Uh, So those are some of the games I played on our our color computer or Coco, as they were affectionately called. And keep in mind, this is before computers had hard drives. So all of your games had to either be on a cartridge that you plugged in the back of the computer um and the computer didn't have a monitor you connected it to a tv uh and tuned it to like channel three uh (laughs) on five inch floppy disks or on cassette tapes so hey so were you guys were you guys channel three people or channel four people uh i don't remember channel three or channel two some get like uh atari 2600 which was the first gaming console i had I think you had to set it to either channel two or channel three. Really? I remember mm-hmm. three and four. I didn't have an Atari. NES was the first system I had. But I remember yeah. always being a channel four person because I felt like a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> I think I probably played some computer games. Like we had a, like old like DOS computer at my, my house. And I probably played some games on it. But the first thing I remember playing is like Mario, the original Super Mario on NES. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we got that one year for Christmas. I was, I think, six, probably old. I would have had to have been older than six because my little sibling was around then and old enough to play with me. So I was probably like eight when we got our Nintendo and we got it on Christmas. Mm -hmm. Technically, I think it was my mom's. You know, we got to play on it. And that's how ours was. My mom bought it for herself and my dad. She's like, oh, we'll play games on this. And then, of course, my (laughs) brother and I took it over. Just usurped it. They never played anything but Mario on it. What's your like fondest memory growing up gaming and doing nerd stuff? Oh man, this is these are hard questions. I have a lot of fond memories. Well, you get one, and the rest are going away. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, here's one that sticks with me. My grandmother actually would play the Atari with me uh, when she came over to babysit. And she really loved Atari pinball and she would yell at the ball and she would lean to one side or the other, you know, to try to <laughs> like we tennis, same thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Ex- exactly the same thing, except, you know, we tennis actually had gyroscopes. motion controls. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think she knew that it wasn't doing anything, but she got really excited about that. And so I have a lot of good memories of playing Atari with my grandmother. Dude, I cannot imagine playing video games with my grandparents. <laughs> Yeah, same here. Even my parents. I think I got my dad to play Duck Hunt one time. (laughs) Oh, one time I did play Wii Tennis with my grandmother. And uh, she threw threw the (laughs) 
remote at the at her own TV screen. <laughs> oh, what a cliche! Yeah, she didn't That's have awesome. the like strap on, and she whacked her own TV. Oh uh, no! Vixen. Did she break it? No, I think it like was one of those like uh, old big screen TVs. Oh, you know, that yeah. had, like the plastic indestructible. <laughs> yeah, it was basically like pretty pretty tough so yeah yeah well i know you told me i only got one memory but i'm gonna tell you about a second memory okay well, well too bad. you'll never be invited back to this podcast again but that, that's okay because <laughs> i i probably wasn't going to be anyways unless i become <laughs> some big name game designer well, with that attitude yeah <laughs> um so my mother loved dr mario mm-hmm. and she doesn't actually remember this very well uh and i had to remind her at christmas it made me really sad but she used to make me the deal was that she would play a game with me if I played Dr. Mario with her. And she was way better at it than I was. Even with the handicap, she usually like creamed me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I hated it. I mean, I didn't hate it (laughs) enough that I wouldn't do it, but I would get really frustrated because I lost so much. Yeah. Um, And so like I did play on my own sometimes to try and like get better so that I could beat her sometimes. But um yeah that was a it's kind of like a puzzly now, like tetris kind of game right oh did you ask what dr mario is yeah it's like tetris except that instead of tetris pieces you've got little pills yeah um and there's there are three different colors so there's blue pills yellow they pills, make that kind pills. of game today i wonder uh i don't know i mean probably i guess probably i mean candy crush is a thing yeah, that's true it's basically like a parable for our um our pharmaceutical you know, system pharmaceutical yeah. system in America basically <laughs> um and so yeah it's a it's a match three game where you're dropping the multicolored pills yeah, yeah, down yeah. and trying to get get rid of the viruses and you, if you played it two player every time you make a match of two or more you send pill fragments over to the other person's screen and screw them up and i discovered you can actually play it online on switch right now like the classic dr mario uh oh. so i'm gonna have to recruit some is that people through the their nes classic thing Mm-hmm. Oh, actually, I think maybe I have seen it on there, but I hate those kind of games, so I just I didn't know you could do it. stuff online with that with oh. the NES Classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah they have there like little ops things on there. Any games that are multiplayer, you can play online together. Let's do some Double Dragon, Drew. <laughs> oh, I'm in. I used to love Double Dragon. <laughs> yeah, it has not aged well. I'll well, actually, that. Double Dragon Two. Yeah, because I think is that the that one where you can get double weapons? One. Double, you double Dragon. Two. You well, you could do two player on the same screen. Oh, I think yeah. Double Dragon One had two player, but it was like you took turns. You the best I mean? Double Dragon game is called River City Ransom. <laughs> that <laughs> game's incredible. Anyway, so where your your parents were okay with you being into games and stuff, or was that? Oh like yeah, a deal? that was that was fine. I mean, they encouraged it. My dad taught me how to use the computer before I could really read, uh, and so wow. when I was in kindergarten, I was ahead of the kids in a lot of ways. And so most of the kids got to use a computer. Like we had one computer in the classroom, and that was one of the like activities you could do. And they mm-hmm. would just like plop me down in days. front of it to keep me busy because they. I already knew how playing Oregon Trail. Yep. Number crunchers or math math bla- math crunchers. That was the one that I was a big fan of. That little little superhero dude. Yeah, I remember all those math games yeah. that tried math to blast trick us into doing math. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Mavis Beacon typing. That wasn't until later. I didn't do that in kindergarten. <laughs> I remember but, that too. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, they were fine with it. They bought me video games, uh, and I'm surprisingly like they bought me Doom. Uh, so I was like blowing up wow. monsters and they didn't <clears throat> seem to have a problem with it. Um, so I think they I'm very grateful for that, actually, because it never gave me the idea that there were things that girls shouldn't be doing that boys could mm. do. Hmm. Um, I didn't learn that. This is until... crazy, like how in retrospect you see how valuable those things are, because during the time, like especially as teenagers or whatever, we're like, oh, our parents suck and they're the worst. But, you know, looking <laughs> back, you can think about all the really great things too that, like that, you know, the, in, during, I mean, I'm assuming at the time you wouldn't have thought, oh, I'm really glad that they're doing this, you know? Oh, yeah. Like it never occurred to me. Um, I think once I get into high school, well, I never really like socialized with other nerdy people, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, my female, my girlfriends that were nerdy weren't into really video games or blowing crap up or 
role playing or Magic the Gathering, like any of that stuff. They were more into like reading fantasy novels and dressing like princesses and <laughs> watching vampire yeah. movies. Uh, so we didn't really have mm -hmm. that in common mm -hmm. other than playing Hero Quest together. My best friend and I played tons of Hero Quest. Um, I missed that one. What Hero is Hero Quest? Quest? Is, so that's a board game, not not video game. Now we're into board games. Okay. Uh, Hero Quest was a one. It was like Dungeons and Dragons Light, the board game version. Yeah. Uh, came out in like okay. the late 80s or early 90s. And there were four different classes that you could play, and they each had like their own card with their stats on it. Um, there was no actual like role playing. It was just you move around this dungeon and there's preset campaigns of here's where the mm -hmm. furniture goes and here's where all the monster figurines go. Um, and one person would GM it and then up to four people would play it. And since it was just two of us, she would play all of the characters <laughs> and she made little backstories for them, like the wizard and the elf or wizard and the dwarf or whatever would have like their clandestine love affairs in the corners between <laughs> turns. Oh boy. Yeah. As, As they want to do you when you're a teenage one. girl yeah. and you have hormones. I was going to say, man, <laughs> I, that is, that's got teenage girl written all over it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, let's be honest. Uh, it's got teenage anybody written all over it. As a side note. Um, so like we're recording this during, well, it's going to come out pretty soon. So we're, in quarantine right and so like one of the things that people can do in the neighborhood is ride their mm -hmm. bikes right so um the there's a bunch of like middle school boys that live on mm -hmm. my cul-de-sac and they've just been on their on their bikes constantly um and so then there's this group of middle school girls <laughs> oh, gosh. from another whole side <laughs> of the whole side of the the uh of of my subdivision um, that have discovered they've discovered oh, each other these two groups have discovered each other and are interacting for the first time and it's been really funny to watch uh all that go down i think so the show hardly. stranger so things cute. was based on your cul-de-sac <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep yep it's yeah like, i would know. absolutely be one of those exactly. girls i probably would have been like sitting on my lawn knowing like the boys are gonna come by <laughs> and like i can i can ogle them <laughs> mm, brother yeah. So, um, so I want to fast forward a little bit and then we'll come back to like, talk about where you grew up and what that was like sure. and, and stuff. Um, but yeah, tell me the, like the, maybe the quick version of how you got started with LTN. Oh, and the quick version. Uh, so the quick version is that, I don't even know where to start with the quick version. You just so get whatever moved... version you want. Well, you can you do the like version you want. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. So, exactly. well, so I, as, as you guys know, but not all of our listeners know, I was working with you guys, um, in game church, uh, starting in, I moved out here to California in, I think 2015. Um, and I started volunteering with them around 2013. Um, after I, run into the group at a, uh, video game convention at PAX East. And, uh, and you were living on yeah. the East coast. You were in, uh, uh Maine, Massachusetts right? at the time. Um, I grew up okay. in Maine and lived as an adult in Massachusetts. Um, so yeah, I was living in Massachusetts, had just started kind of getting into Christianity, taking it seriously, started attending church and was in a, missions uh not really missions training program but like a uh, program that taught about the spread of christianity through the world kind of history of that um going through the bible just really giving it, it's called perspectives on the world christian movement and it's like this three-month intensive course on this is at a school you're at or uh no this is this is put on by an organization uh by yeah it was put on by like some individuals within various uh local churches. Um, and okay. so our church had a missions committee that was uh, pretty serious about people taking this. And they said, hey, we'll reimburse anybody who wants to take this class for half of the cost of the class hmm. once you're done. And at the time, I was like, I want to learn as much as I can right now. I'm part of this church. And I'm kind of behind the ball. Like I didn't grow up learning about church history or the Bible. So what better way than to take an intensive class? Because that's what I do. Cause I'm a nerd. 
<laughs> uh, and so right around that time is when I ran into game church. And so the two things kind of coincided really well, where I was in this place where I was like the most important thing I could be doing with my life is bringing people hope and what better way to do that than with something I'm already passionate about video game gaming. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that led to one thing after another, started getting more involved with helping out with the game church, Facebook community and the, you know, going out to California and actually attending a convention with them, um, starting to write articles for the website. And that's how I met Drew. Um, and fast forward to coming out here to California and uh, our work with Game Church leading into starting Love Thy Nerd, which is... Well, as, and as, not to glaze over a really big deal, but like you moved across the country to pursue like ministry. Yes. Which yeah, is kind of true. a big deal. It, it was a big deal. Yeah. Um, and so, Chris, actually, you inspired me a lot with that. Um, you know, that's really what I wanted you. to get to is I just wanted everybody <laughs> to know how inspirational <laughs> I can be. You, yeah, sometimes you have your moments. Mm -hmm. Uh, but no, so when I met you in October of that year, I think 2013, the first time I came out here, uh, you and your wife had just made your big move, like what, two months before that? Yeah. Uh, in September. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you had just moved to California from Arizona to, work to be on staff with game church. Mm -hmm. And that was just so wild to me that you would drop everything, pack up your things, move states, um, to do what seemed kind of crazy from every normal person in the world perspective. Um, and it kind of planted that seed of this is a thing that people do that people like are willing to jump and take risks and, uh, step into the unknown for what they believe in. Um, and so then that, that kind of stuck with me. And I remember sitting with you at PAX East next year in the spring where I was talking about, like, I, I want to, I want to quit my job. I hate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, what were you doing uh, at the time? I was working for GE healthcare um, either in the planning department, uh, like ordering uh, and like shipping, receiving, um, not in the warehouse, but doing like the ordering and post uh, purchase orders and stuff. Or I had moved into the warehouse and was doing shipping and receiving because I hated being a planner. Like it was <laughs> not, I, you know, and I did not have any idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like I graduated yeah. college barely knowing, like having some wild idea that I was maybe going to start a bookstore or like work in a bookstore or I had no idea. Um, and so I, I was just working whatever jobs would have me uh, to make money. And it was miserable. So finally, mm -hmm. like seeing a purpose to my life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, something that I could do that would be meaningful and purposeful and satisfying uh, and fulfilling was tempting, but it was scary. Uh, and it took a couple of years to finally get to the point where I was just like, I'm done with what I'm doing. And I want, I feel led to try this new scary thing and drop everything. And, and it sucked. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, like the dis making the decision to leave behind my family, my friends, I love new England. Uh, I never thought that I would ever want to leave. Uh, and like the things that I was used to, like, I don't know, seasons and water <laughs> and rivers and lakes and streams and trees. trees. Hey, we have uh, trees. Don't you dare. We, yeah, but we don't have forests, at least yeah. like not within, like you have to drive two hours up steep mountains to get to them. Seasonal affect disorder. Uh, oh, no, I still get that, actually. Uh, oh, really? In California? I do. Yeah. It's not as bad because the winter isn't as long. Uh, but there's it has more to do with the lack of daylight than it has to do with the temperature. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, the days still get shorter here. And the sunlight, the sun still doesn't climb as high in the horizon. So I definitely feel like between October and February, uh, it's hard. It's not as hard, yeah. but it's hard. 
So Mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. So I packed up my car. Uh, I had my little Chevy Prism. I packed that as full as it would get with my belongings. Gave away Prism. It's a good car. Still driving it, huh? I it's still it's still going. I've had that car now for I think twelve years. Uh, it's twenty nineteen. It's a ninety nine Prism. It's twenty years old, but I haven't had it that whole time. So maybe you had it for like sixteen years. Still going. Nice. Mine was a ninety four Geo Prism. Before like Chevy bought right the Geo from Toyota, but anyway, yeah. So packed so, up your car and you kind of made like a little road trip out of it. I remember I did. It was awesome. I had watched. Did you guys ever see the movie uh, Chef? No. Mm-mm. It was this uh, lesser. It wasn't like a big block op Oster, blockbuster. That's the word. Uh, like I think it was kind of an indie film, but it did hit theaters. Um, it was about this guy who's a chef and he gets fired from his job where he's, they're basically telling him like, you cannot be creative in the kitchen. You have to make the menu that people expect Mm -hmm. and that we know works. And he's like, but people are bored with the food and like, we're getting crap reviews from reviewers because they want something new. And they're like, nope, this is what works. This is what you're making. Mm -hmm. And so he ends up getting fired and his wife or ex-wife keeps convincing him like dude you should buy a food truck he's like i'm not gonna get a food truck what are you crazy but then he ends up buying a food truck and making uh cubanos uh some sort of i think they're yeah cuban sandwiches um and like does this road trip from wherever he picks it up across the country and like takes his son his estranged son and his son is like his social media genius And gets him all this fame and they try food at all the different places they go. And I watched that. I'm like, I want to do that. I want to do a food road trip. Mm. And so when it came time to move to California, I'm like, it's going to be cheaper if I drive there than and buy new stuff than it will be if I pack up my belongings, ship them out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then like, I don't know where I'm going to live because I didn't have, I had like a couch, a, a spare room to sleep in for like four weeks while I found a new place to live Um, because someone I went to church with had a sister in law and brother that live out here. And so like, what am I going to do with a trailer full of stuff? If I have it shipped, like I don't have any place to put it until I find a place to live. So I'm just going to pack up my car and I'll buy a new bed and dresser and stuff like yard sales are still a thing. And so like, I know people everywhere Why don't I couch, basically couch surfed my way across, like people have spare rooms. So I stayed in guest rooms and I stayed Mm -hmm. in a couple of hotels, but I stopped all the places that I knew people and that I wanted to see. So like, and tried like their local, the thing they're known for in each of those places. It was awesome. So like I had crab cakes in Maryland and I had sweet tea on a rocking chair in a porch in (laughs) North Carolina I had biscuits and gravy. Uh, Our friend Zach Hughes made me homemade biscuits and gravy. Oh, wow. Uh, You did better than I did. Uh, You know, (laughs) uh, Drew took me to Nashville Hot Chicken and Waffles. Hmm. Uh, I met Drew for the first time in person on that trip. Uh, Stayed at his house uh, for two nights because I took a side trip up to Kentucky and went to the Mammoth Caves. Uh, And here's where the trip gets dirty. Uh, So there's an old text adventure called Adventure or Colossal Caves. It was like one of the first, might have been the first text adventure. Do you guys know what I mean by text adventure? I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So for anybody who's listening that doesn't, it's like old school before there were graphics in video games, like they were just text based games where it would tell you, you wake up in a forest clearing and there's exits to the north and the south and you have nothing uh what do you do and so you could tell it i go north or i go south or i look at the tree and it tells you i don't understand what you mean by look at the tree uh and then yeah, you remember they were that you have pre-programmed to say, with only certain like responses right. and stuff so. well and you can't use like prepositions or anything so you have to say look tree yeah. and if there's something to look at and it it knows then it would be like when you look at the tree you see uh, uh there's a I don't know. There's an elf door in the tree or whatever. Um, it's a heck of a tree. I don't know. They just yeah. don't make them like they used to, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they were super frustrating because you'd be like, I want to open door. I'm sorry. I don't know what you mean by open door. 
use door. I don't know what you mean by use door. <laughs> use key in door. And then you can open the door because you, you told it the right thing. Uh, but so the first one of these was based on the mammoth cave system uh, or a, another a different cave system connected to the mammoth cave system down in uh, Kentucky. And so once I learned that at a, on a previous trip down to Tennessee, I'm like, I, if I ever get a chance, I'm going to go there and I'm going to play Colossal Cave inside the Mammoth Caves. <laughs> uh, so I did it. I loaded it on my phone. I didn't have time to play it because I, I was on a tour. And so like I had to follow the tour guide and the rest of the group. But I did load it on my phone. And so I saw That's the first screen. a heck of a bucket of- list item right there. <laughs> it was it was awesome i took a picture of it but obviously like you can't see anything because my screen is just this glowing a cave, blue screen yeah, yeah. but <laughs> uh i i knocked that off my bucket list that was pretty cool nice that's cool so um so fast forward a little bit mm-hmm. and we um we started love thy nerd mm-hmm. uh which i guess we've talked about on this show before but i guess i guess i'd like to hear from you like what makes you passionate about this kind of like ministry of like ministry to nerds like Mm -hmm. what 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 gets you up in the morning to do this stuff well right now not a whole lot because quarantine (laughs) is the worst i knew Uh, you were gonna say that as soon as he phrased the question (laughs) that way i knew that's exactly what she was gonna say yeah yeah you guys have heard me complain enough got you pegged i see a lot like in different nerd circles, like in cosplay circles or video game circles or board gaming, like there is a lot of hurt that being a nerd tends to tends to come along with being a nerd. A lot of us grew up feeling isolated, uh, feeling ostracized, feeling like people didn't really get us. And not everyone, like there are nerds out there who are perfectly like well-adjusted people who actually grew up like in popular circles with sports or whatever, or who became nerdy later in life. But a lot of us have that hurt Mm -hmm. that we're still holding on to. And I especially saw it at a lot of like anime conventions, a lot of like cosplay culture has hurt and just this search for belonging and acceptance that comes Mm -hmm. with it. And I don't think like, the acceptance, I think, is there in those circles, but a lot of it is very, is still kind of surface level. Like you are bonding together over affinity, but not necessarily over a deeper friendship. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, it certainly happens. There are plenty of gaming groups that have developed into more than just we gather for games mm-hmm. once a week and play games. Like they've developed into real life friendships who support one another and are you know do life together as we say in the church um but i i can't think of anything you know like i said i can't think of anything more important than bringing hope to people and that's something that i feel like i have a real opportunity to do with this kind of work Mm -hmm. is look for those places that there is hurt that there is sadness brokenness darkness and be able to bring a message of life and hope um you know what we have with even with our facebook community a place where people can gather and talk about whatever weird crap they want to and share whatever dumb memes and there are people there who will love those things but so then so many dumb memes <laughs> so many dumb memes and it's wonderful <laughs> i i love it, it gets sometimes a, it is it, sometimes it's wonderful sometimes it's a bit much <laughs> uh, but you know having that as a place where people can find friendships um you know find people who genuinely care about them not Mm -hmm. just their dumb memes but actually want to know like what's going on in your life how can we help you how can we support you um and especially like at conventions where we go and teach games to people not because we want something out of it i mean the getting badges from developers and getting games is awesome but I would do that. I would demo games even if I didn't get those things because just being able to interact with people and show them the things I love and hear about what they love. uh, That's so great. I love it. Yeah, that's cool. So um, you've touched on this already, but you grew up in Maine, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, What was, what was that like? What was your upbringing like? Um, 
did you go to church or anything? Like, what was your family? It was exactly situation? like the show Gilmore Girls. <laughs> uh, it was not because Gilmore Girls takes place in Connecticut, which is yeah, but it's you know it's all, same, right? it's all the same over it, there. <laughs> oh my goodness! So actually, this is funny. Uh, a friend of mine, a uh, Facebook friend, I haven't actually met him in person, but he lives in uh, Arizona. He's a minister in the uh, Anglican Church. Uh, he grew up in Maine, and so we we kind of share that. He shared this video of this this dude who was going on a rant about like five things he learned about Maine from talking to a bunch of Mainers that insisted he do this video. Mm. And uh, it it cracks me up because he's like, so first thing is that there's no R anywhere. You can't find it. Uh, <laughs> and I don't... People I don't, don't pronounce R's? Oh, is that what you mean? No, definitely not. Okay. Anybody who's who so, grew up in Maine, like whose family is from Maine uh, yeah. has this accent that, yeah, like you, you pop the, the stereotype is you park the, park the car in the parking lot. Uh, <laughs> and people absolutely talk that way. Um, my you parents, don't have like a super thick accent, but there are some words that you'll say that are weird. I can't think of any of them right now. But. <laughs> because I tried really hard to not have an accent. I did not want to be one of those Mainers <laughs> with the accent. Yeah. Um, so if you ever figure out which words they are that you, that I say weird, let me know because I oh, don't know what they are. If I hear it on are. this podcast, I will for sure shame you. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't think I've ever noticed it with you either. So Yeah, well, it's like I said, I tried really hard to not say yeah. it. But my parents, like they'll say, like, what, what do they say? Like they'll say uh, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> and they they don't have a super strong main accent like they're not one of those like fishermen but they definitely have it and i notice it and it cracks me up every time uh, i find it yeah. endearing now but at the time it was <laughs> uh not not something i wanted in my life what did your uh, parents do when uh you were growing up? my mother was uh worked at a bank uh up until i don't remember sometime when i was in high school i think uh, she worked at a bank and she got laid off at one point and then ended up just staying home. Uh, she and working uh, some odd jobs like she would help out at local auctions. We had friends that did like antiques auctions. Mm -hmm. And so she would help doing money management because she was good at it because she'd worked at a bank. Um, and then my dad was a store manager for Hannaford Brothers, which is a big grocery store chain up there in the Northeast. Okay. Are your parents still around? Mm -hmm. Yep. They are both, they're married to one another still. They live in the same house I grew up in. Uh, they will die in that house. Uh, or, <laughs> if you or, in a dad still or in a hospital. Uh, but they have no plans of leaving mm. Maine at this point. I think at some point they probably thought about like buying an RV and tra traveling around the country, but they have yeah. grandkids now. My, my sister has two kids. And so, uh, they travel, they go to Florida twice a year now. Uh, they go down to Disney World a couple times a year, which obviously they can't do right now, which they're right, bummed yeah. about. Yeah. Like they actually had a trip planned for May mm. that they cancel. I think they postponed it to September, but I I would be very surprised. And they also understand that like, we're probably not going to be able to do it all this year. But yeah, that's a bummer. Mm. Yeah, it, it really is because they look forward to that. They We used to go as a family for two weeks every year. Uh, and so now they go yeah. for like a week at a time, twice a year. Mm. Yeah. We were planning to take our kids to the Harry Potter stuff in Florida uh, and Orlando. So I don't, I, I mean, I guess we're just telling them it's postponed. We'll do it eventually. Yeah. But yeah, but it's a bummer. So, um, wait, do you, I don't think you answered no. About, like, do you grow up in the church or anything? Uh, so my family is all Catholic. Okay. Um, they aren't all practicing Catholics um, to, like, a super big degree. Like, um, yeah. when I was young, we used to go to Mass every week. Uh, at least my mother and I. I don't know if my father ever went with us except for holidays because with his job, he either couldn't work go on a Sunday because he was working mm -hmm. or he was tired and so he was resting. Um, 
So I don't remember specifically, but then my younger sibling came along and the church that we were at did not really look kindly on like fussy children in mass. <laughs> uh, and so that was, that was kind of a, uh, it stopped happening because uh, she was just not going to sit still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so then we would still go for holidays. Like we would go for Christmas Eve and we would go for Easter. Um, and then eventually it just kind of stopped happening. And I know my mom feels guilty about that. And it's the good old Catholic guilt. <laughs> well, no, because she feels like she should have brought me up properly Catholic uh, okay. uh, and didn't. And it was funny because when I first like, became a Christian, I had this idea in my mind that it was going to make it right again, like that my mom could stop feeling guilty because I was a Christian now. And mm -hmm. like, but I don't think it really worked because <laughs> uh, Protestant Christian is different than Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's, it didn't really work out the way I thought. Um, like, I don't think that she feels unhappy with me being a christian but mm -hmm. um so yeah so anyways that that's so i grew up kind of like with some catholic values but not a lot of catholic education um went to sunday school for like two years um i don't really remember anything about it except that somebody stole my raincoat <laughs> uh, and that i really hated having to go to school on a weekend oh yeah yeah uh even though that's i fair. liked school uh, I didn't, Sunday school was a different thing. Like it wasn't the same kind of school and it just, yeah. Yeah. It's really different now. I remember growing up. I mean, I, I guess I'd say it's different now for my kids because they generally, generally like going to church a lot because of there's like quite a bit of programming that's geared mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. But I remember as a kid, I just hated it. I hated <laughs> going. I hated sitting in the pew. Yeah. I would try to fall asleep if I could. And then my mom would get mad if I fell asleep. I'd like fall asleep and hit my head on like the like the Bible or hymnal rack, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. <laughs> I don't uh, see. I don't remember uh, if I hated it. Um, I think there were certainly things I hated about it. Like I hated kneelers. Um, mm -hmm. So... And if those you, are the things, like the that, yeah, the little things that, that fold that down your... that you kneel on. Yeah, so they fold down and you kneel on them for certain parts of the of the service. Yeah, and they were so uncomfortable. And you're supposed to like kneel upright. You're not supposed to like rest back on your mm -hmm. haunches while mm -hmm. you're kneeling. And so, but I, they were so uncomfortable, and my little child body was not having it. Um. And yeah, there were definitely parts that I was bored during, but the church was, it was a very beautiful church, um, you know, very like mini cathedral type thing yeah. with, you know, the stations of the cross statues that were shipped directly from Italy, um, stained glass windows, the painted ceilings um, with lots of cherubs and a big, you know, God with his long flowing hair and beard. Um, and so that's kind of the idea I grew up with of God is this guy, this old dude in the sky who looks over you and judges you and tells you what to do uh, and knows everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether that is an act, whether that is accurate to what the Catholic Church would have actually taught me about God uh, is probably not true. But that's I mean, that's the picture of God that I saw every time I went. Right. Uh, and the angels are little, they're, they're adult angels and there are baby angels. <laughs> uh, so uh, I really love that. And I think that's part of why I didn't, uh, why I ended up becoming interested in religion again is I loved that ritual of it. Like the, <laughs> you sing songs, you're in a beautiful building, um, like yeah, there was a lot of that beauty that stuck with me. Even after I decided that I'm not Catholic, I don't believe in this stuff. Mm -hmm. How did you get to that point? The not believing in this stuff? Yeah. Um, I don't, you know what, I don't even remember. All I remember is at some point in high school, I learned the word agnostic and what it meant. And I was like, <laughs> that's me. Like, I don't not believe in the stuff i don't believe in it like i don't see any rational reason to believe or not believe in the concept of a personal god because 
Like, how could we know? How could we know something that doesn't exist yeah. in this reality? Um, and so I remember my mother and I would have fights about it where I would try to explain to her and she would get very upset. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's where I was at in high school is I decided it just, I, there was no way of knowing. So I was just not going to weigh in one way or the other. Hmm. Yeah. So how did you come around? Like, cause you're not there anymore, right? Uh, or do you want to like confess <laughs> that that's where you, uh, it's okay, well, this is a safe place. <laughs> so I'm not a Catholic anymore. So confession isn't really a thing. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, <wait>. touche. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was a really long, weird, wild journey. Um, when I was in at the end of high school, beginning of college, I started, uh, I dated this guy in Canada that I met on the internet. Uh, and that was a whole thing because this was before online dating was really a thing, and everyone thought I was crazy. Yeah. Uh, because he could was be an it ICQ or was it AOL? Or uh, we met in Lycos a ya where? Yahoo Yahoo chat ah, room. Okay, uh, yeah. it was there was the there were these Yahoo chat role playing games, quote unquote, uh, in the arts and entertainment chat section, mm -hmm. uh, where people would make these little rooms and. Uh, I don't know how much actual role playing, like people were, if people were actually doing any quote unquote role playing or if they were just basically like playing make believe. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what I was doing. I, I had my own little kingdom. I was, and I don't think I've had this conversation in a really long time. So the entire world now gets to learn about my delusions in uh, high school. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was Sylvia. Uh, I, I had a kingdom, the kingdom of Tristan. Uh, and so, yeah, so through playing this game, I met, met this guy in Canada and he was a Wiccan, uh, so modern into modern witchcraft, uh, mm -hmm. neo-paganism. And that really struck me at, like that made sense to me because, you know, the whole idea behind Wicca is you are honoring nature you're celebrating like the changing of the seasons so the major holidays are the equinoxes and the solstices mm -hmm. and it all takes its inspiration from like ancient mythology and uh you know it's all this like sanitized version of it right so um trying to re res resurrect isn't the right word but resurrect old pagan worship practices they're, they're just like I don't know. There, there are there are Wiccans who claim that they are past all their practices are passed down from ancient times from family to family, and who knows? Maybe some of them are, but a lot mm -hmm. of them are just nonsense. Like people wrote books to make money. Uh, but that whole idea of honoring nature mental made a lot of sense to me because those were things that I could actually see around me. Right? Like you can see the changing of the seasons. You can see when the flowers are blooming and the flowers are dying and the darkest, mm -hmm. you know, honoring the darkest day of the year and the brightest day of the year. And I had always loved like going out and playing in the woods and picking flowers and, uh, and had read a lot of fantasy novels. And so the magical elements of it really uh, resonated with me too. So um, yeah, I got really into Wicca and reading about mythology for a long time. Um, and then, and at some point that just kind of shifted into a general interest in mythology and comparative religion. Uh, in college, I actually ended up switching from a biology major to a religion and philosophy major, uh, because you wanted something more practical. <laughs> yes, yeah, <right>. exactly. <laughs> um, no, because so I, when you get to college, uh, they don't, you know, they tell, they give you all these, like, you can be whatever you want and you don't have to choose your major for two and a half years. And the reality is that if you go in to a liberal arts college saying, I think I might want to be a biology major, you have to start your first semester because there are so many labs and things that you need to take. Mm -hmm. So even though you don't need to declare it officially, uh, you need to start then. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I kind of got pigeonholed into, well, I guess I'm going to be a biology major because that's one of the things I think I might want to do. Um, and I liked it. 
months to a certain point. But after about two and a half years of that, and I remember after having almost failed organic chemistry, because organic chemistry is the spawn of the devil. Mm, um, amen. <laughs> uh, I sat like sitting in my first day of, I think it was like genetics or uh, cell biology or something. I'm like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> this is not the thing that I can do. Uh, like all my friends already had, like they were working in the lab, like as a lab assistants with professors. And I had not done any of that. I hadn't even tried to get a position um, in a lab. And so I thought I, I should switch. <laughs> and I'd been taking as my electives philosophy and religion classes. Those were the things that I was really enjoying. So I ended up switching to that. Uh, and being at a, even though it was a secular college, um, they had just this wealth of books on any religion or mythology or um, culture that you could imagine. Mm. And so I just spent long hours in the library, like checking out books on Native American religion and Greek mythology and Norse mythology and African culture and like digging into the really old books in the basement that nobody ever went to, <laughs> um, you know, reading all this old, so like uh, anthropology and sociology textbooks or not textbooks, but books. Um, and really just digging into how different cultures saw the world uh, and saw the spiritual portion of the world in particular. Yeah. Um, Have you always been like interested in, digging deep into things that's i'm sensing a theme of like <laughs> a desire for like nerd understanding how things work and mm -hmm. are interconnected and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah i think so i mean going all the way back to like i was one of those uh gifted and talented kids uh which hey, i didn't even realize too. i didn't realize that that <laughs> was like a national program until very recently i just thought it was a thing like thought, you, did. you thought just they made for you. It special just for you <laughs> uh not not quite that far um but uh sixth grade we learn latin and i loved that that was so much fun like learning this ancient language uh in my free time and like in high school i was part of math teams so yeah i've always been into like taking the extra credit study stuff and so while you were studying all this stuff though you got into Christianity came into play in that somehow. Yeah. Um, I, you know, like one of the classes I had to take for my major was I had to take one class on Christianity. Uh, and I think it was like, I don't even remember what class it was. I remember enjoying it, but it didn't, it never made me think like I want to become a Christian, mm -hmm. but from a mm -hmm. intellectual perspective, uh, it, I really enjoyed it. Um, at some point I started reading some of the Psalms and at this point I was still considering myself pagan at least. Um, but there was a lot in the Psalms that really appealed to me that I could, you know, take things out of um, that still made sense. Lots of honoring. Yeah. I mean, the Psalms are great. They, they just are full of emotion uh, and honoring weather and nature and, mm -hmm. um, so the actually becoming a Christian and like digging into it deeply didn't happen until I was about 30. Um, so at that point I was living in Massachusetts, uh, college is over. Um, and I had some friends that I was playing board games with once a week. Um, and one of them was a Christian and he and I had been had kind of bonded over a love of books like he I saw his C.S. Lewis books on his bookshelf one day and it wasn't the Narnia books it was his uh, space trilogy mm, and yeah. I didn't even know that C.S. Lewis had written sci-fi and yeah. so like hey can I read those and so he lent them to me and uh, we didn't talk a lot about the books um, and maybe we did I don't really remember uh, but it wasn't like this like Christian book club thing. It was just like he lent me books. I read them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so after reading that, I learned about um, G.K. Chesterton, who was uh, one of C.S. Lewis's uh, inspirations for writing. Uh, and he wrote a bunch of really weird, like fairy tale-esque books 
uh, that had a lot of Christian underpinnings. And so, uh, so I was reading that stuff. And at some point I sank into depression as I am wont to do from time to time. And I learned that he had a Bible study group that he ran. And I was like, I haven't been in any sort of like spiritual community for a while. And I think that that would be a really good thing for me to do right now. Um, even if I don't believe everything that they believe, having other people around who believe something, um, mm -hmm. I think would be really helpful. And so I asked if I could go and he said, yeah, sure. Um, obviously inside he was probably much more excited about it than that, but he, he, was, he was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started going to their Bible study once a week um, or their small group. And uh, at that point, like I still, I remember telling them like I gave my quote unquote testimony because that was the thing you did. And my testimony was the story I've just told you. And it ended with, I am happy with where I'm at. I'm not going to become a Christian. And to their credit, nobody like, outwardly judged me for it inside they were probably freaking out a little bit but um they everyone was so patient with me and hmm. even though the things i was telling them like i was into all the things in my life were completely alien to them i'm sure paganism and uh kirtan which is like yoga um sacred chanting uh, and singing mm -hmm. um and polyamory and goth clubs and hanging out with hippies, all this stuff I'm sure was like just mind boggling to these people, mm -hmm. to, to my friends. Um, but they, they were great. They loved me and I was really struck by how well they loved one another mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. how open were they were with one another about their lives and their struggles, their struggles in their marriages. Um, and that was just not something I'd ever seen before. Um, yeah. And at a certain point, I realized, like, hey, these things, like, there's a wall between me and them that our friendship isn't going to continue to get any deeper unless I figure out what to do about these things we've been learning. And so I did, like I always do, which is read books uh, <laughs> to try and learn more. And yeah. uh, over time kind of became, there wasn't like a moment where I was like, I'm a Christian now, but I kind of got more comfortable with the idea of this divine sacred thing that I honor and see in the world could actually be a personal deity um, and not just a metaphor for the universal energy or whatever it was I was calling it at the time to make myself more, com more comfortable. Yeah. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another. I started attend. Find I found a church to attend uh, because, like, that was not an uncomfortable notion for me because I'd gone to church before. I'd gone to church as a kid, mm -hmm. um, and now it was just not going to a Catholic church. Um, and yeah, and one thing led to another, and now I'm here. <laughs> That's cool. Well, we are glad you're here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. Like I've obviously heard you tell all that story before, but I just love it. Cause I think you just have such a genuine, like, I don't know, curiosity or I think there mm -hmm. so many people, I think especially Christians would benefit from that type of desire that you have to actually learn what it is we say we believe and mm -hmm. like really learn it and be able to back that up with, with some things. And I think you're really good at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was also thinking as you were sharing your story about how, like, I don't know, I just think it's kind of rare that, maybe it's not rare, we just think it is sometimes, but, like, you know, that you had these people that around you that were willing to let you continue to hang out, continue mm -hmm. to, like, be a part of their community, even though you weren't, like, bought into it, you know? Yeah, I, like... I don't think at the time I realized, I definitely didn't realize how lucky I was. Um, mm. I just kind of take it for granted because that's what I was used to, right? Is people right. who just accept you wherever you're at. And I think the only people, there were probably a few Christians. I hadn't really had a lot of experiences with Christians, honestly. Like, I think I knew one Christian in uh, college, really. Uh, and I wasn't really close with her. Um, mm -hmm. But... Uh, yeah, I, I just that was what I was used to is friends who just accept where you're at. Um, and I, I, I do wish now looking back, 
Like, I wish that I'd had more friends who did question me and challenge me on some of the life choices I made because some of them were not good. Yeah. Uh, and nobody really was doing that. Or the ones who were doing it were doing it in a very judgmental mm. sort of way instead of a... Hmm? Do you want to share an example? I'm uh, curious. Yeah, I can share an example. So um, I think the only... Well, I'm trying to think if I have one. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, not not anything that I want to share on this podcast. <laughs> uh, okay, that's, that's fine. That's a little understandable. There are a few things that I do not want to share with the entire world all at once, yeah. or you know, all hundred people that listen to this. Um, but uh, add a few zeros to that number. Mm, ten, mm-hmm. ten, Just kidding. Ten million people that listen to this. The dozens of people. <sighs> the dozens of people. Um, But yeah, I just didn't really have people in my life who were challenging me on the choices I was making in a way that they were saying, hey, I'm I'm concerned about you. Um, And but I did. uh, Where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. Just how how great it was to have a group of people who um, clearly did not agree with the life choices I was making or had made. and didn't believe the same things I believed, but never pushed at me on them in a way that, cause they, I would have, I would have fled like right. m- yeah. 100% if they had told me like that I was going to hell or that I needed to become mm. a Christian. Or I think I had one moment, one moment where my friend was driving me home after the group and he told me something like, you know, my prayer is for you is that you'll come to understand that Jesus is your Lord or some, some, something like that. And that was a really uncomfortable moment for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, I kind of flinched at that <laughs> moment. Sure. Uh, but other than that, people who were just willing to let me listen and, pro- uh, or who were willing to listen and let me talk and process and figure it out on my own, uh, was just wonderful. I feel like that's so important. And I think that's something that we lose. I, I think this goes beyond even just Christianity, but I think especially within Christians, like we have this sense of like fabricated urgency to like, we want people to go at our pace instead Mm -hmm. of allowing them to go at their pace, you know, because we feel like, Oh, well, if they die tomorrow, they're going to hell. And so I got to hurry up and convert them. And like, it just creates this, what I think is a false sense of urgency. Um, Whereas just, I think your story is a perfect example of people allowing you to go at your pace. And, um, and then it's, it's really your story then, you know, Mm -hmm. like instead of it being some agenda that was forced on you, then it's not really yours. And it's not really something that's I think personal and as meaningful as it could be. Whereas in your case, I think it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, I think, um, I think I I had maybe sort of the opposite <laughs> experience uh, in my conversion, as it were, or whatever you want to call it. Um, whenever I became a Christian, um, I went to a church where there was a lot of pressure mm-hmm. to like make a decision um, and to come like come forward, come uh, to the altar call. Like uh, I went yeah. to this church where there were altar calls mm-hmm. literally every Sunday and every Wednesday night. So <laughs> Wednesday night youth group in high school when I started going like, and then Sunday morning. Yeah. And uh, I didn't grow up with any of that stuff. So um, like I grew up in kind of more mainline Protestant type churches rather than evangelical churches. So like I actually in one way am kind of thankful for it just in the sense of like, it instilled in me a, I don't know, like a, what, what the right word is, but like a desire to figure out what I think about it. I was like, everybody here is so certain mm-hmm. and sure and, and really wants me to be certain and sure. So I should at least like work really hard to investigate it and think about like where I, where I stand when it comes to um, the world and God and life and what the, what the point of it all is, you know? Yeah. You know, I think there's definitely some benefit to that too, in that I think a lot of people are spiritually lazy without, Mm -hmm. like, not everyone is automatically driven to, I need to read as many books as I can to learn about this thing as I was. And I'm not even that way anymore. Like, I, I think... I have a lot less patience for digging through piles of books as I once <laughs> than I once did. 
uh, because You're just I have a lot. You're just an old curmudgeon now. I am an old curmudgeon. Man, I have so many distractions now. I got Animal Crossing. Yeah, sell those and turnips. <laughs> I got to sell turnips, man. I don't have time for books. Not the that I don't market, need. The turnip market's not going to play itself, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, like, there is benefit in not, not pressuring people, but um, encouraging people to think about these things because not everyone yeah. is going to. It's so much easier to just not think about it. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's so much easier to just distract yourself from the deeper spiritual questions of life with all the millions of things we do to keep ourselves busy than it is to actually sit down and like really do some deep soul mm -hmm. searching about what is it that I believe in? Uh, do I believe yeah. in anything? Why do I believe it? Why is it important for me to think about these things? Um, so I think, and in, in, I don't want to mm -hmm. say I'm, I am the special person, but I, I do think that. Well, you are. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I just don't want to, I don't want to. I heard that you were in the, uh, the gifted class. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I heard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. And I think like to those, you know, groups like the one I was in in high school can get a bad rap sometimes as if like, um, they're just so fixated on like conversion and stuff that they don't care about you or whatever. And I think those people did care about me um, and did want the best for me. So I, you know, I guess I'm just like, as I'm getting older, I'm, it's important to me to unpack the good and mm -hmm. the, you know, the good and the, the things that, cause there's a lot of things about that sort of, I don't know, upbringing that I don't, that I've sort of, I don't really jive with anymore. <laughs> You've had um, to recover from. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, in a way. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of really like there are a lot of really great people that really loved me and that like I wouldn't pro I probably wouldn't I wouldn't be working for a love thy nerd for sure mm -hmm. in a way if 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 it weren't for those appointments and relationships and um time. So um you know, it's cool. It's I guess all I'm trying to say is it's I'm glad that there are people in our lives that you know, that all this is related to relationships, mm -hmm. you know. Um so yeah, it's a big part of what we do with a line nerd. Yeah, absolutely. So cool. Well, uh, it was just cool. Cause I hadn't like really heard the whole story. Like I've heard bits and pieces of how you became a Christian and all that kind of stuff. So now um, you've got it. The E yeah. true Hollywood, E Hollywood, true <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. You got about the, the, that's the short version of the yeah. story. That's the medium length version of the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool. Well, thanks for doing this, April Lynn. Yeah. This is great. You are welcome. I'm glad that I could we'll have be here. you. We'll have you on again sometime, hopefully. <laughs> if, if, I thought you said that I couldn't be. Well, if she plays her cards right. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Well, this was fun. <laughs> <laughs>